You know, I was the shortest model that had ever been in the business. I was five, six and a half. I lied. I said I was five, seven, but they could tell I was five, six. <laughs> I'm Lauren Hutton, and I'm here to explain it all. I remember the exact moment when I decided to become a model because I was trying to get to Africa. And then I found out that the $200 I had with me wasn't going to cut the mustard. So I had to stop in New York City and then I didn't have a job and I'd get a job. And Christian Dior, New York, they told me they couldn't help me. Actually, they, they had a little ad in the New York Times. And then I said as I left, I'll work for anything over my shoulder. And they hired me for $50 a week. Christian Dior New York was just for like the big department store, Saks and Lord and & Taylor and everything. And me and uh, another model would sit in the back. I'm sitting there looking at a magazine in the first week that I'm there. The other model, who was about 10 years older than me, said, those are photography models pointing to the, into the magazine. And she said, you could never be one of those. She said, look at your nose. She said, and what about the giant gap in your teeth? Then she said, and they make in an hour what you make in a week. I mean, my life was decided right then because I understood that for probably every hour that I worked, I'd get two or three in Africa or Burma or the Amazon or all the places I had to go to since I was about five and a half years old. We were like athletes, the great models. We could work all day. We could work four times harder than anybody else. And so I yelled over to my old man and I said, what, can, what do I do to get a contract? And he said, tell all your photographers, call up Eileen, tell her you won't do any makeup. They have the most money. You won't do any makeup and uh, tell all your photographers that you want a contract. About six months later, Dick Avedon told me, well, I told Dick immediately, and Dick said, make it exclusive. And I started laughing. I said, nobody has that much money, Dick. Don't be silly. But they did. And uh, Dick was, as usual, right. <laughs> I had already started making movies, and I just finished one called Welcome to LA with uh, Bob Altman was producing. And I had to go to Boston to go on television. And there's this beautiful young girl, about half my age maybe. You know, I told her how you become a success. I said, you work time, four times harder than anybody else. You've got to have the talent for whatever it is you're trying to do. You need a lot of luck because it's always luck with whatever you're doing. And you need horse strength. And those are the four basic things you need. She turns just like this on a stool. So she's completely profile and she's sitting like right here next to me. So I have to turn profile and no one else can see her eyes, just me. And what I'm looking at is pure hatred. Then she said, why you dumb luck, chutzpah, which is cheap aggression, or someone, and she leaned forward for this, someone you knew. So she was insinuating, you know what she was insinuating, I just sort of couldn't believe it. So I leaned forward too, we were practically nose to nose, and I said, right, I my way to the top. And then I felt, I started laughing so hard, I fell off the stool. By the time I got up and dusted myself off, she was gone. And I spent the next three days in bed, alternately crying or laughing, because it was ridiculous and absurd. And then the old man, he said, you certainly didn't do that with anybody, so. Why? And then I would start crying and then we'd start laughing. He said, I've got it. You call a press conference. Tell your agents that you want a press conference and you'll, you'll tell them that you don't work for an old dinosaur of a corporation. You work for modern, smart, with it people who understand that she was baiting you. And obviously that wasn't the truth. And that was right. Fashion. It's changed into this thing of fashionistas. There's zillions of them. I kind of love looking good. It's fun. 
to look in the mirror and swell up with pride. And, and I used to make all my own clothes when I was in high school because I was poor. And I could get a yard of cloth for a quarter. So I could get four yards and make a big, and I had made crinolines, which was, it was 50s. My first crinoline was uh, unfortunately made of wire. It was chicken wire, I think, chicken mesh. And I made a big circle. I knew what these things looked like, these crinolines. A big mesh, and then I tied an elastic in my waist. I did this all out in the shed so no one saw. And then I tied string all the way around it, and I pushed the full circle skirt over it, and the wire kept poking through because it was thin material, but that's okay. And I hid it in the woods on the way up to school, and then when I got the place in the woods where I could jump in and change out of whatever I had on, and put this thing on, and I walked very proudly, and it swayed like a bell, and it was really something. And then I went to sit down at my desk, and I had forgotten that the desk went like this, so you couldn't get the hoop, and it went over my head, and my panties showed, and they didn't allow that in those days at all, so I was kicked out of school for a couple of days. And that's how I got into fashion. Love, men, good books, knock me out continually. Do you meet people in the street that inspire you? Nature, I was just diving with 400 sharks at a whack, I won't tell you where. And they're just there, ah, and they don't have to work. And they're all very, very happy. I saw about, mostly they're reef sharks, which are not rough guys, but I saw some lone hammerheads. They're tough on you if they take an ocean. It was heaven. It was really something. These, I had a great time today. She's a wonderful photographer and uh, she had wonderful people she worked with. And that was inspiring all day. And, and the new bazaar, they're spectacular. I mean, imagine being brave enough to use someone 482. That's saying something for them. First of all, it's our job to have hope especially women, Yuval Noah Harari. He's an Israeli, he's really, really one of those geniuses. And uh, he wrote Sapiens, and he says that if every country puts 2% to what they're already taking out of their gross national product, that's what you do, you throw money at it, and you get everybody smart that comes together on it. Yuval says that will do it, and I believe it. I don't have much of any skincare regime until I met Strivectin. And now I sound like a shill, which I am not. I never would do, I was a pretty good model. I, I had a moral bottom. I wouldn't do uh, wild fur of any kind. I wouldn't do cigarettes. I told them I was a user, but I certainly wasn't a pusher. And I didn't use much of any thing but soap and water. And then this Strivectin stuff has a lot of retinol, which I was always very suspicious of turns out that it is great for your skin. So now I sort of slather myself up in all their various retinol stuff. Mostly there's something called Star, which is oil, and you uh, have a bottle this big, which will last for like six months, because you only use about three drops. If I could change anything about my life, I'd like to live to 400. About the shape that I'm in now is fine because big change is coming. And I'll bet we get through them because we're an awfully ingenious animal. And the other thing is I would give anything to meet my, my father, my real father. I was born in World War II. They had some sort of fight. My mother, my real father, she was from Charleston, South Carolina. He was from Oxford, Mississippi. And uh, I didn't ever get to meet him. One of my many goddaughters, who now has given me a great godson and a great goddaughter, Indy, Indigo, she told me to buckle up, because I never buckled my seatbelts. I just, just didn't. There was something wrong with me that I had never gotten it. And when she had Indy, she said, you've got to start buckling up, because I want you to be around for all her life and all mine. And I still didn't do it, but then it kept 
ringing in my ears, buckle up, buckle up. And so finally, now I always buckle up. No, the problem with modeling is that now it's famous. So there are tens of thousands of people and I don't even know how it works anymore. They just, it's all about how many followers they get and sort of dumb stuff because people need to see you and they need to see your personality a little and they need to see a little bit of yourself. So you need to get out and see them. My ultimate advice to young women who want to step into the modeling industry. I don't think you step into any industry. I think you study it like hell.